one of the guys in Gonzo's. Go back to, awesome. Can you see the PowerPoint out there in internet world? He's not, he's busy today. I think I did the screen share right. Can you see the PowerPoint? Uh, no. All oh. I see is James Brown. Okay, that's what I was worried about. Let me try to figure this out real quick. So I may need to redo the screen see, share. So I had an hour we book <laughs> if so, I'll do that. I don't know what I did with it. How about now? It was like it was like disrupting my Nope. Oh, there we go. Yep. Now I can. Now you can. Yep. Awesome. Discard it. Probably use the casual like finger scratch method. All right. Mm -hmm. oh, Tanner. Yes. <laughs> oh, clicker for Shelly. Just had the clicker. I oh, that, like, it's in the book. Like, awesome. So again, we're going to go over objectives with this one. We're focusing on defining terrorism, what it is, and then defining domestic versus international terrorism. Um, so this, uh, this section with the national standards is both for terrorism and natural disasters. We're going to be treating both of those situations essentially the same, but with the precautions of man-made versus natural. Uh, so a lot of it, when we go into the seaburn side of it, natural disasters can cause seaburn incidences. People can cause seaburn incidences. Uh, with that, um, man-made disasters have some additional things that we need to worry about. Uh, so point two is understanding our role as EMS in man-made or natural disasters. And then understanding your appropriate safety precautions. So this is going to go deep into every level of what you can consider safety precautions, which is boring and dry. And I'm sorry for the next 45 minutes. Uh, so terrorism, domestic, this and the next slide are almost word for word. It's gonna essentially be terroristic acts done by groups or individuals, but it depends on who's it directed to when it's directed at their own government or populations, people who live in America and they're attacking America, or they live in Chicago, they're ta attacking Chicago. You look at instances like the Boston Marathon bombing, that's acts of domestic terrorism, Waco, domestic, domestic terrorism. All of these, huh? Eh? No, that was international, because it, but it, Huh? You have Oklahoma City when you when you're talking about um, even things as little as all these mass shootings that we have. It's not something that sounds like a big disaster. It's still terrorism because it's directed at populations, and it's someone within that area doing it. it yep. So country. So when we're, it's directed at their own government or population. So it's directed at the city government, if it's directed at officials, if it's directed at the people, all of that's gonna be domestic terrorism. International terrorism is defined as those, could be the same type of terroristic acts, but it's done by the groups and individuals that are foreign based and or directed by countries or groups outside of the target country. So you look at, the terroristic acts of 9-11 are the prime example that we all should know of. That's international terrorism. Um, the, we had an, there was an anthrax scare in the 90s. Um, I believe that early 2000s. I believe that was, oh, that was domestic, wasn't it? So was something. Yeah. Um, there's, there's so uh, outside of America, there's tons of instances of international terrorism. Uh, the initial bombings on, or the initial attacks on Ukraine from Russia would have been classed as terroristic as well as being acts of war. Um, when we're talking about terrorism, 
we're aiming at CBRN, which is the acronym CBRNE, standing for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive. So when we're getting into that. Yes, or it has to cross international lines. So Americans can can create Americans can do the international terrorism against America if it's being done from an if it crosses international borders to happen. Huh? Training. Training. If if the action happened in America and only in America, it would still be classed as domestic. So the action of the terrorism has to cross international boundaries in order to be classed as international terrorism. So even if that person gained all the information that they needed outside of the United States, if they came back, planned it, and did it all within the boundaries of the United States, that would still be domestic. But if they used their training and brought resources in from outside of the United States and did it, that would be classed as international because it was it crossed international borders to happen. Does that make sense, Lewis? Okay. All right, so again, chemical, biological, radio radiological, nuclear, and explosive, we're gonna be referring all of that as Seaburn. So when we're, our role in EMS is when these happen, we need to understand that as emergency responders, we may be targets. We are one of the easiest targets out there because they know for a fact we're gonna be there. Um, be aware of when we're talking about explosive devices, many times the initial exposure is not the only explosion to happen. So be aware of the possibility of secondary devices uh, that goes for any type of attack. There may be secondary devices. There was, uh, you look at the Unabomber. He had multiple instances. Huh? Yeah. Uh, there was multiple instances where uh, there was an initial bomb to bring in rescuers and then a secondary bomb to cre actually create the most amount of damage by, di by affecting the responders from the initial blast. W anytime we're dealing with a terroristic attack, remember, your safety comes first. That's going to be the highlight of what we're talking about today. Um, that's something that we may be putting ourselves in harm anytime we go on a call. If we're going on this type of call, we know we're going into harm's way. We need to take the appropriate precautions to minimize that risk. You're going to be following hazmat and mass casualty incidences procedures, as well as following that ICS. If you have a, even a suspected terrorist a, a attack, you're going to have every agency there. Law enforcement will be there. Fire will be there. EMS will be there. It, yep. And so this is a great time where unified command is most likely going to be used. When you're identifying those post threats, um, the occupancy and location of an incident. So you're looking for incidences that are happening in high profile areas, maybe crowded areas. The occupancy, how many people does this hold? Most terror attacks don't happen in the middle of a field on a Sunday. It's probably not gonna happen. Types of events happening. Most people that want to cause hysteria, what they do is they find crowded populated areas, crowded populated events, things that are scheduled that they know are going to happen. That's why 
with the Boston Marathon bombing. It's a great time to, it, it was a great opportunity for that person to do that because they knew how many people were going to be part of that. They knew the finish line was where people are going to be gathering. They want to see people cross that line. It's a, it's a place to cause a lot of damage, a lot of hysteria. It's, that's their way of getting their message across. Timing of events. Is it in the middle of the day? Is it in the middle of the night? You know, a concert in the middle of the night might not get as many at people's attention as one that happens maybe six o'clock, you know, right after people get off work where they're actually available. Something that's happening on the weekend may have a lot more people show up than something happening on a Tuesday. You know, look for your on scene warning signs as well. You know, when you're talking about you're looking for, uh, Secondary devices, uh, think about you get on scene, you see where the initial blast happened. Well, what around me can cause the potential for another thing? What's something that's out of place? What's something that just doesn't quite belong? These are all things to be thinking about. Uh, going back to occupancy and location, symbolic and historical targets. Um, the World Trade Center was a huge one at the time. I mean, that's where a lot of, that's where a ton of New York City was based out of, really, at, at that point in time. It's, it was one of the major hubs of America at the time. It was running a lot of, oh, it was running like everything at that point. Every international trade. Yeah. Trade. yeah. Uh, yeah. Examples that your book lists are government buildings. The Statue of Liberty would be, uh, potential target Liberty Bell, Wall Street Financial District. Again, World Trade Center was part of that financial district. Uh, you look at public buildings or assemblies, controversial businesses, people who are trying to spread their message are going to attack the places that disagree with what they stand for. Infrastructure systems. Uh, when the World Trade Center was hit, the Pentagon was also hit. That's both a government building and an inf infrastructure uh, system. So that's all stuff to think about. Again, types of events. It's not just the events you're going to, but what type of call are you going to? Are you going to an explosion or an incendiary? Uh, when we're talking about incendiary devices, you know, Molotov cocktails, riots, these can... Uh, People don't want to call it it, but a lot of the riots that happened over COVID could easily be classed as domestic terrorism. You know, the, the art, serial arsonists, it, it can be classed as domestic terrorism. These are things that you need to be concerned about because especially when you get into serial arsonists, their cool down period typically gets shorter and shorter. And if you know, holy crap, we've ran three major fires this week. Maybe you're going to be stocking your ambulance a little bit differently to geared towards burn kits and the medications you're going to need for burn victims. You know, this is something that you're going to be thinking about not only when you go to these events, but when you stock your ambulance at shift change. How are you going to be preparing for this? Uh, non traumatic mass casualty instances. Um, people may not be physically injured, but they may um, have illnesses, sicknesses, that's going to, when we go into our seabrain, that's going to be talking a lot more about that biologic, biological agents. Um, again, on scene warning signs, unexplained patterns of illnesses, deaths, especially when we get into radiological and biological, uh, you, you're going to see it. When people just are dropping like flies and there's something wrong. If you go to a at a regular office and three people are down why are they down that that's that in it in and of itself is an on-scene warning sign that okay there's something happening here we need we need to be a little extra cautious yep yep ppe yep yep we're gonna have all of that and we're gonna be talking about extra ppe that we may need here in just a minute.
So when we're talking about the potential threats, we're also going to be wanting to look at the potential harms that we can face uh, based off these threats. So there's a acronym trace MP. So that's your thermal harms, your, your burns, your, uh, this could be chemical burns, heat burns. This could be extreme cold burns. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of a liquid nitrogen attack, but I'm sure it's not the most unheard of thing in the world. Uh, yeah. yeah. Radiological harm. Uh, the different levels of radiological activity can cause different reactions within your body, which we've already kind of talked about in previous chapters. But um, yeah, the alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, these all produce different reactions within the body. They can cause short-term and long-term effects. Radiological sickness can last weeks. Uh, the recovery from it, it can be terrible. So keep in mind the harm that you risk there, asphyxiation, the lack of oxygen in the atmosphere. Sometimes it's something that is noticeable. Sometimes it's not. So the way your body processes asphyxiation is it never knows how much, how much oxygen is in your body, but it knows how much CO2 you're blowing out. So if you enter a environment that's overly rich in, say, nitrogen, there's a lot more risks associated with it. Why are we... Oop. Well. Yep. I think it kicked everybody out of that. Cyber terrorism. Cyber terror. Uh, that's not something we're going to be dealing with. But it's like iRobot. My comment on cyber terrorism is the fact that cyber terrorism doesn't have patience. It has people, it has victims, doesn't have, doesn't have patience. So it's not something we're dealing with. Law enforcement, cool. You're going to be a cop, go for it. Deal with that. I don't know if I'm for that. <laughs> um, but the associated risks with the terroristic activity, with the idea of uh, having to see all of that to go through that uh, survivor's guilt is a very heavy thing. Uh, it affects first responders heaviest in terroristic attacks, especially, and even natural disasters, because someone that you've ridden your rig with for the past 10 years is gone, but you're still here. That's, that's a very real thing that happens, and it can tear somebody apart. So that is a very real harm that we need to keep in our heads when we go to things and figure out how we need to process that. Seaburn and hazmat, uh, something I didn't talk about in hazmat, but it's super huge in here uh, because this is, when we're talking about terrorism, we're far more likely to have the radiological explosive type things happen. Time, distance, and shielding, TDS. So minimize time, maximize distance. General rule of thumb is if I can look at a thing and go like this with my thumb, if I can still see it past my thumb, I'm probably too close to that thing. Um, that's going to be our, our best bet with anything explosive, anything radiological, that's going to be our best bet. And even then, sometimes we, just being able to cover it's still too close. Um, yep. And then shielding, when we're talking about shielding, that's using any appropriate shielding method. So that could be PPE, that could be your SCBA for our fire guys, or maybe EMS is getting out level A suited and SCBA up too. Um, hazmat suits. This also can, may include buildings and vehicles. When we're talking about explosive incidences, when we're dealing with explosions and blasts, the vehicle alone is not sufficient. That being said, if I have a concrete building between me and the thing that just exploded, that's probably sufficient. Um, if I have a building between me and, oh, uh, what's a good, I don't want to use radiological or a chemical spill, probably good. If there's a chemical spill outside and I'm in my vehicle, it's probably not going to affect me that much. Um, 
those are things to keep in mind. We're going to be talking about that throughout the next handful of slides. Uh, so all, all of the next ones are going to be our response to the specific sections of Seaburn. So in a chemical response, our self-protection is going to be our PPE, our standard precautions. That may include gowns, that may include hazmat type suits. It will almost always include respiratory protection. And in any type of incident, we should be using a buddy system. But especially with chemical type instances, we want a rapid intervention team or a RIT crew available. Our four major routes that the uh, chemical issues are going to be affecting are ab absorption through the skin. So that looks, we go to, yeah, starting on page 1255, it goes in a lot better depth. But the way you can tell on the absorption is that's where you're going to have injury to the skin itself, your skin temperature, your blood flow to that area may be affected. The higher the concentration of the uh, substance, the greater your exposure is going to be. And the more hair on that affected area, the larger that exposure is going to be. Uh, essentially, with, when it comes to that, it comes down to surface area. If I don't have any hair on my arm, I can only affect the skin on my arm. My arm's covered in hair like it is. I'm not just affecting the skin on my arm. I'm affecting every individual hair that's on my arm. So you have a larger rate of exposure with that. The length of exposure is going to be important to know, and the type of agent is going to define your treatment as well. When we're talking about ingestion, obviously by the mouth, you swallowed something. That's going to be affecting everything from your upper airway down into your digestive tract. So vector, disease-carrying organism, jagged glass or metal. So, oh, that, well, now we're, sorry. Ingestion didn't have a big list. It went straight into injection, sorry. Um, but with that, your ingestion. This type of instance might not be a terrorism event. This might, just being in Seaburn in general, this could be your kid swallowed some tub cleaner. I mean, it, it's, it can be as simple as that. It can be as major as somebody poisoned their wife's food. I mean, it, it, it can, it's anywhere in between and even further out than that. Injection, your needles, projectiles. This is where vectors, your disease-carrying organisms, jagged glass or metal, um, something that we don't see all that often, but it was used historically was uh, to shatter glass and throw it at people. That has been historically used in combat for centuries. Um, it's super easy to put something onto metal or glass that's broken that you know people are going to come in contact with. Uh, something as simple as contaminating a, a broken glass bottle or having a contaminated something within glass and then throwing that bottle that can be considered uh, something that would cause an injection or puncturing injury that could contaminate somebody syringes one of the biggest threats to us uh, responders when we go to overdoses is, is the idea of a needle or a syringe just laying out High pressure devices such as hydraulics, uh, we deal a lot with that. Uh, eh? Did you make the sound? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, when those burst, they can cause a lot of damage, not just from the pressure itself, but the hydraulic fluid getting into you. That can do a lot of damage as well. When we're talking about inhalation, obviously, this is stuff you breathe in. Uh, it affects your rate of breathing, depth of breathing. It can it can affect how your lungs function properly. Again, our response to radiological and nuclear, that TDS, time, distance, and shielding, get as far away from there as fast as you can. That is not something you need to deal with. There are special teams for that. Apparently, our Seaburn teams are out of Cheyenne 
both with the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard. Not our job, not local EMS job. You will get your patient when they are done dealing with them, but that is not something that we're gonna deal with. Treat all explosions as a potential, potential radiological or nuclear incident. You do not know what caused the explosion. You do not know what they put in there. And there's a lot of substances that by themselves are not necessarily radiologically dangerous, but when mixed with other chemicals, when exposed to heat, they can start to produce that radiation that can be harmful. And again, we're gonna be following that mass casualty incident and ICS procedures in any of these situations. Explosions, if we have a bomb threat, you're obviously gonna to wanna to be prepared before that actual blast. You're gonna want as much PPE as you can get on, on uh, to prepare for that. And then even post blast, again, there may be secondary devices, there may be multiple devices. We don't know how many explosions there's going to be. Protect yourself. Just because the explosion already happened doesn't mean you get to take off your Kevlar or whatever your department has issued you. That's something that uh, Kevlar and ballistic helmets are being issued out more now to fire EMS than ever in history. And this is a perfect example of why. If you go to an explosion, you want as much protection as you have. Well, you can have. Yeah, that too. There's crazy people. Take as many precautions as you can. Obviously, if you don't have the equipment to protect yourself, you can't protect yourself. Think about your safety and then treat every threat in every situation as if it's real until it's proven otherwise. We have had bomb threats here in Douglas. We have had us respond and sit on a scene for five hours before Cheyenne was able to get there and determine that it was a false accusation but it happens. Even here in rural, rural Douglas, Wyoming, we've had bomb threats. It is real till it's not. Because if we treat it like it's not and then it becomes real, we are great, greatly underprepared. Now we're gonna be going into our characteristics. This goes into not only the characteristics of the scene itself, but the characteristics of what we're gonna be dealing with. So chemical, attack, uh, chemical agents are physical, they're volatile. We're gonna be looking at the volatility of that chemical. We need to know what the chemical is and the tox toxicologic, yeah, that's spelled right. It just looks weird. The toxicologic, um, we, need, we need to know how it affects the, th the things that it comes in contact with. Uh, when we're doing this, there is an acronym called SLUGEM. Uh, so this is going more towards nerve agents, um, but it's something we need to look for. Salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI upset, emesis, and meiosis. That whole list is found on page, yep, 1260. So that uh, salivation, it's the uh, stimulation of your sal salivary glands. Lacrimation, stimulation of the lacrimal glands. Urination, obviously, uh, it's a relaxation of the internal sphincter of the urethra. Defecation, relaxation of the anal sphincter. GI upset, changes the smooth muscle tone within the GI tract. Emesis, vomiting because of the GI system effects and meiosis is you're gonna be your abnormal contractions in the pupils. So if you have patients with one or more of these, you need to be thinking, okay, what were they exposed to? What is causing this? Vomiting in and of itself is not necessarily a huge issue, but if they're vomiting while pissing and shitting themselves, mind my language, that might be an issue. Could be something as simple as food poisoning, could be a nerve agent. If they have all that, plus their pupils are all screwed up. Okay, well now we, now we really know something's going on. Um, when we're looking at classifications, any type of chemical is gonna be classed as a choking agent, a vesicating agent or a blistering agent, 
Uh, this is where we get into that chemical burn type of thing. Chemical burns are very quickly turn into second degree burns or blistering burns. Uh, cyanides, we're going to be looking into those. Those are your general poisons. Nerve agents, but then riot control agents are also stuff we have to look at. Look at, you know, mace is a terribly uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It affects everything around it, um, and once it's there, it usually stays, um, and it's something that the effects of it last. So, my father was a sheriff's deputy for about. I think five, six years in that time, he had his partner accidentally mace him in a bar fight. That was a terrible, terrible time. It affects your vision. It affects your tear glands. And especially nowadays with the mace that they have out now, where it's almost a liquid that it's sprayed. Um, yeah, it's, it's less of a aerosol and it's more of a stream of this stuff. Uh, you take, we, for example, a handful of years ago, we had, uh, who is now a sheriff's deputy. She was at the time the city canine. They had a, um, somebody, it was a massive chase between Converse and Natrona County. They ended up at a bridge on the highway. She was taken out from the city to do that, she, be, being a canine unit. The guy ended up hijacking her patrol vehicle from the interstate, took it up to Casper, where Casper's SWAT team shot in one of the, uh, the mace grenade things, and it covered every inch of that patrol vehicle. And that patrol vehicle had to be decommissioned because it just couldn't, they couldn't get it out. Um, something with... Something with riot control agents, that those mace bombs are used for riot control. They even just standard hand pepper spray is used in riot control. With, with that, tear gas is another issue. Um, with these agents, they reactivate with water. So that's why when, they, when people tell you to flush it, it's flushed with a milk. It's never flushed with water. And even if you get it wiped completely out, when, if you are exposed to that as a responder, just know that the next shower you take is going to suck. It's going to suck for every second of that shower because as the water hits it, it reactivates that agent. And then as that agent flows down your body, it will continue to burn every inch that it touches. It's not a pleasant experience. You do not want this to happen. Yes. Base is an oil base. Yeah. It will. It will run, and it it just is not a fun time. Continuing on to our Seaburn characteristics for biological uh, agents. So when we're getting into this, we're talking about microorganisms and toxins that can cause disease processes. So when we're doing this, our considerations that we need to think about is the infectivity. How infectious is this? How communicable is this? The virulence. So what, at what concentration of the virus does it become transferable? Um, you look at something as simple as the HIV virus. There's people now that can take pills to where it is such a low viral amount in their body that, it's in, that it can't be transferred but they still have to live with the virus in their body. Um, so we're looking at the virulence, we're looking at the infectivity, the toxicity of, some, of something. How, how toxic is this if it actually gets into your body? Is it, what effects is it gonna have on the body? The incubation period, how long does it have to be in your body before it actually becomes an issue? This is gonna uh, be effect when we're talking about monitoring these symptoms how long do we have to monitor this patient how long is this patient going to probably need to be in the hospital for the transmissibility is it transmitted by is it a bloodborne is it an airborne is it by spores or port yes yeah, spores um the lethality if someone gets this how likely are they to die 
and then the st stability. Um, stable agents versus unstable agents can cause different predictability in the other uh, things that we're thinking about. Um, we make sure there's nothing else that, so yeah, this is, this one's a really big one. So I, I kind of left it up to you guys to actually read the chapter on this because it goes into our bacteria like anthrax and cholera, the plague, Q fever. There's a T word in there that I still can't pronounce. I've looked at it all day and I cannot pronounce this word. T t Talermia? Is that, is that right? God, I hate that word. I, I struggled for an hour earlier. Uh, toxins, uh, botuli botulinum, ricin is a common one. I've heard that one thrown around a lot. The um, stif staphylococcal enterotoxins, or SEB, your trichothacine. God, it's a lot of chemical names. And then in the viruses, your smallpox and such like that, I can't, I'm leaving it really up to you guys to go in because there's paragraphs on every single one of those. And, and that's just too much for us to go in depth with. And really, you guys need to be reading your books anyways. Um, all right. It's just my job. When we go into our radioactive and nuclear obviously nuclear things are radioactive so we're gonna they kind of get combined we look at with this it's more looking at what types of incidences we may run into so the scenarios are you know, military nuclear devices uh, so things can go off when they're not supposed to and there's hundreds of what I know well, there are hundreds of undetonated, I, I don't want to call it artillery uh, rounds, but uh, heavy ammunition, what? Yeah, UXOs that are buried on different military bases. There are things that don't hit their intended target and they're just never seen again. And if they don't detonate at that point in time, then they're still considered armed. I'm seeing videos all the time of people doing that magnet fishing and finding random undetonated military devices in rivers. And they have to then call the United States military to come figure out whether or not it's safe. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's something, I mean, we, we have nuclear, we have military nuclear facilities in this state. That is something that we may have to deal with. Improvised nuclear devices. Yeah, that one's going to be one where the physical act of assembling, uh, putting it in without proper shielding. So uh, people that may be doing this that aren't sanctioned to be dealing with the nuclear power and they're doing it with all the wrong PPE they may be now a patient with radioact or radiological sickness. Radioactive sickness is something that takes a while. You have to have a lot of exposure over a while for it to really get bad. But when it does get bad, it stays bad. And it, it can make people deathly sick. Yeah. That's another thing. Uh, radiological dispersion devices, RDDs, or dirty bombs. Uh, devices that decimate radioactive material, conventional bomb that spreads a radioactive some substance when exploding. Uh, someone, I would hate to see it happen, someone take uranium from the uranium mine and integrate it into another tr traditional explosive like a pipe bomb. And now when it blows, it's ch sending those chunks everywhere terrible day but it's a possibility again these are what we call high risk low frequency calls something that we will probably never see in our career but we have to know about it 
in the event that it happens. Sabotage, standpoint of nuclear terrorism, it, this is the most likely thing. So with us having nuclear power plants and nuclear uh, military facilities, these are going to be targets of terrorism. Uh, that is actually a concern that Wyoming's had for years is if there were ever a terrorist attack on Wyoming, it would be at our nuclear silos. Uh, that's, that, that is a concern we have here. And when it comes to sabotage, it can be sabotaged by major instances, or it could be people intentionally screwing up a process that then contaminates water supplies. Um, it, it can be a whole slew of things. Railroads. I saw a video today. They are, they are finding um, that, that people are placing these metal derailing things on uh, railway, railways. There's people now that are walking railways in order to find these, and they place it on one track. It's kind of a weird arch shape, and it's just enough to get that, those uh, wheels off that track, and it's causing derailments. There are people out there that think that that's the best way to send their message. And it causes so many issues. And it causes a lot of hazards for us as responders. So we had one get up. Does anyone else need restrooms or anything? Yeah, well, it's because he drinks half the pot. <laughs> it's a little bit left. Yep. So we only got a couple more slides. It's about 9.20 now. I, I, I was really hope I knew that it was going to take the entire class to do this, and I was really hoping it wouldn't, but it's a ton of information for us to cover a ton in one night um, and we didn't even hit probably half of what you should know this is where this this class in particular is one you have to read your books and this unfortunately is also some of the driest information in your book i mean all of it's dry it's all dry reading out of textbooks for anything is dry information especially when it comes to first response because most of what we read feels like it's not going to be used, but it's important information to have. Uh, it is, yeah, boring, boring and hard. Uh, so when it's, when something is dry, it, it doesn't really catch your attention. It doesn't, it doesn't maintain your attention span that well. Oh yeah, there, there are definitely a lot of great information to have. Just sometimes it can be very hard for some people. Like for me, I, I have a really hard time reading out of textbooks without falling asleep. And EMS textbooks put me to sleep faster than most others. All right. Well, I, uh, Oh, give information about dates, well, anniversaries. Yep, so that goes into the historical and symbolic part of your places uh, and, the, and the times of event, uh, the events happening and the times of those events. So anniversaries uh, are always a threat. Every major anniversary for 9-11, we have a scare in... Uh, New York that it might happen again um, because they're the same extremist groups that and that essentially caused those attacks are still active and there's always the thought of especially when we hit that 20th that 10th anniversary the 20th anniversary these big anniversaries of it there's always the thought of okay well that this this would be the time if they were going to do it again it's going to be on an anniversary of it um Yeah. 
and especially uh, it could be anniversaries of anything, especially when it comes to what their cause is. Um, wasn't oh, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. It could have been just a land day or it could have happened. I can't remember exactly what happened. So. That might be a Mandela effect. People often, like, like it could be people random, but they want to attach themselves. That's what some people want to do. Ooh. Talks about cyber terrorism in your book. It, the EMT must be aware of the computer data systems. <laughs> While essential to healthcare can pose a liability and danger of compromise. Sounds like it's our problem a little bit. Like they could yeah, it's art. <laughs> the worst thing about that is when they um, will lock a hospital's computers and then make them pay, and they have to pay because there's no. Other so way that actually pay. happened recently to Gillette. Mm -hmm. yep. I was, I, I, I knew it was a local-ish hospital. Uh, Gillette had somebody get into their system, and they had it shut down for like a week. It was, it was really bad. But I just uh, saw the uh, well, I think one one year was a, an all pipeline. Uh, uh, was it in Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, they shut down Colorado. They, they, they shut down the pipeline where. Yes. All the gas. You answer his question. You got more information on it. So yes, there was a terrorist attack on a pipeline via computer, right. where they held the pipeline ransom. All right. Real quick, we we only got a few more slides here, Lois. So if we can try and kick through them, I want to try and get us out here pretty soon. Um. So when we're talking about our our last part of Seaburn is that E, it's explosives. So again, we're talking about those incendiary devices, those Molotov cocktails, the, the people who intentionally set fire to places. It could also be uh, something like a propane bomb or a timed uh, electrical arc within a flammable <coughs> substance. Sure. Yeah. Um, with these, also, obviously, there's inherent risk with those. Um, when we're talking about explosives, we have blast injuries, and there's blast injury patterns. When we're talking about lungs, uh, it, when there's a direct uh, injury with involving the lungs with a blast injury, you're looking at the overpressurization of lungs that can cause the issues there. Uh, ear injuries, anyone that's been around a firearm, that tinnitus that you have just from this sounds of gunshots. I know. <laughs> um, gunfire is a, is a micro explosion. That is the smallest scale of the damage to your ear that explosions can have. You're around car bombs, hand grenades, you're around uh, or C4, or all any improvised explosive device like a pipe bomb, the blast from that's going to cause that tenfold because of the level of God. Those are fun. Yeah, um, abdominal injuries. Uh, your your abdomen's a major cavity with a bunch of organs in it, and some of those organs really do not like shock waves hitting them. Especially you look at your. Uh, Solid are your solid organs do not compensate as well as your hollow organs do. Your hollow organs, like your your stomach and your intestines, they have room to flex with that. Your solid organs don't. Um, and brain injuries, you know, you're going to have that coup counter coup as well as just the overpressurization in your head. It can cause 
uh, strokes. It's, it, it can cause a lot of the same concussion type, uh, stroke type symptoms with tra traumatic brain injuries, even without that direct blow to the head. Um, and all of those go, there's a paragraph on each of those in the book. One second. Okay. We're almost done. If that wasn't the coordinator for the class, I wouldn't have answered it, I promise. He's going to have to do a bunch of editing on this. Um, explosive injuries, you're, you're also, those are traditionally injuries that are specific to blast injuries. You're also going to have any type of major traumas associated with the blast injury that you need to look for. Um, but these are things that you're going to, these are special considerations with blast injuries that are different than any other type of trauma. Treatment for blast injuries, um, you're really gonna be, be treating it no different than any other uh, injury. You're gonna be following your local protocols and uh, treating it as appropriate. Uh, brain injuries are treated as brain injuries. Lung injuries are treated as lung injuries. Your abdomen is gonna be treated like an abdomen. Uh, things, it's more of, if you have explosives there, these are things that you may need to do extra checks on because this is something that's common. It's a pattern that happens with blast injuries. Something else to note um, that is not anywhere in the book, but it is a real world, world thing to know about is that blast injuries are exponentially worse within water because when you're in atmospheric air, your body's used to that it can adjust to the atmosphere. When you're in water, you're stuck at whatever the water pressure is. Um, so there is a terrible scenario, the whole, if, if you're at a pool and a hand grenade's thrown, do you jump in the water or do you try to hide on ground? Well, if that grenade goes off and you're in the water and you're in the water, it, that's this type of overpressurization that will collapse lungs. That's what's going to burst your organs instead of just damage your organs. Um, so if you have a blast injury of someone in water, that's an extra thing that you need to be worried about because it's going to exaggerate their, their injuries. EMS's role within these incidences are going to be notification. So you need to be able to notify any and all responding agencies of what's going on, any and all receiving hospitals, and have that communication, that notification of who's I see, who's establishing what. Uh, essentially, you need to make sure that everybody's informed. Identification, you're identifying what the issue is and identifying the steps that need to be taken. The protection, protect yourself, and then protect your patients as best you can. And decon, you know, we talked about uh, decontamination a little bit. Uh, when If you continue on with hazmat certifications, it goes a lot deeper into that. Um, but with your decon, that's something in any seaburn incident, it's treated like a hazmat incident when it comes to decon. You need to be deconned afterwards. Your rig needs to be deconned and anything that you and your patients touched needs to be heavily decontaminated afterwards. Last thing for we got for you guys is protect yourself first. That is the heaviest priority in it is that you are not good to anyone if you are not protected yourself. So know what to look for, know those signs, know what is around know your disaster plans. Uh, disaster plans is one of those key words, those hot things that as Cher likes to call them, or the good things, whatever you want to call them. Um, 
disaster plans. Every agency has it. Every agency has their own version of it. Know what yours is. Know what your community's is. Do not rush into things. That's the biggest thing is that people, especially first responders, are like, I need to help. Step back and think about how you can help first. Okay. If you run in before a plan is established, you can easily become a patient yourself and you can become a liability on that scene. Use your resources, use law enforcement, use your fire guys, use your emergency management, use the National Guard if it's available to you, use your specialty teams. Uh, we've talked about for us, our regional response team for hazardous materials comes out of Casper. But if we're out on Jenny Trail or out by the uh, North Antelope Mine, Gillette's probably going to beat them by an hour, realistically. Uh, so use your resources, know your resources, and do not be afraid to call for more help than what you need. Like I said, uh, when we talked about the hazmat, um, in the mass casualty. Nobody's going to be mad to be called out and then canceled. But if they get called out after they're needed and everybody's behind the ball, that's where people are going to start having issues because you, you want to be ahead of the game. It's better to need it. Well, have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. It's the oldest saying moms have been saying it for years. Probably true. With that, do we have any questions, comments, or concerns on this? All right. With that, I'm going to stop the recording real quick. Everybody in internet land got disconnected a while ago, and I was not able to get them back on, so that sucks. Um.